I guess we should start. Uh, it's about the time. So welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, talk, uh, which is entitled Transforming the Future uh, Open Source Innovations for Digital Public Goods and Infrastructures. I am David Manset. Uh, I am from the International Telecommunication Union, which is um, the oldest uh, UN agency in charge of uh, digital transformation uh, in general. Uh, this talk has been prepared with two of my colleagues from UNDP, which are also partners of the Open Source Ecosystem Enabler Project, Michael Downey and Oba um, Ajiboy, that uh, could not make it uh, today, but we'll have a recorded uh, video message from uh, Oba later in the presentation. So, let's start. Um, Created in 2015, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, are uh, presently under development uh, and getting late. late. Uh, there are 17 of them with associated targets, and only 15% are on track as of today. However, it's been acknowledged by the UN system and ecosystem that these uh, development goals uh, would benefit greatly from digital, uh, and actually 70% of them already uh, benefit uh, from developments uh, in, in digital. And so digital should be further leveraged in the near future. So today we uh, are at the intersection of the development of these uh, goals and a massive push worldwide for digital public goods and infrastructures uh, that, uh, that, that, that uh, do uh, leverage on open source. So there is a need for uh, embracing open source, teaching open source, scaling open source solutions worldwide and supporting the countries in developing their tools to achieve, to attain these development goals. And that is exactly what the Open Source Ecosystem Enabler project is about. Uh, it's a project that uh, receives funding from the European Commission and witnesses collaboration between the ITU and UNDP, the UN Development Programme. It's a 3.5 years uh, programme that uh, started uh, on the 1st of September 2023. It's a global coordination where we intend to develop a full open source training program and support countries in their digital public goods and infrastructures development, in particular by setting up two pilots uh, in terms of their open source program offices and actual expert staff on site that will help the government. So our objective is, is to enhance their capacity to uh, uh, develop open source uh, in, in this at the local, regional and international uh, levels. And we want to do this by improving knowledge, coordinating actions uh, in this space and strengthening the ecosystem uh, that uh, these countries can uh, leverage on. So we have three byproducts expected in the project. One is a complete framework for capacity building, that's the OZ framework. Uh, we intend to deploy concretely two open source program offices in selected countries that I will talk more about uh, later in the talk. And then we are going to try and uh, systematize, develop an institutional program for other countries to uh, follow up. As I said, it's a 3.5 years uh, program. We are already um, concluding the first year of this uh, project. And we've gone through the uh, foundation's works in, and built a documentation of our uh, expected uh, training framework. We've also gone through the country selection process that I will uh, synthesize later on uh, to uh, set up the open source program offices over the next coming year. Uh, the intent here is to provide them with two full years of support with uh, this program and seek for sustainability of their open source program offices. So to start with the framework, so we've, we've built a competency framework uh, and we've done so by going through various case studies um, and identifying major categories and competencies that um, the different user profiles uh, in these countries may be uh, seeking for uh, support. 
And we've started working on building the training materials and teaming up with the community with um, a number of uh, partners to um, basically develop this holistic program uh, and make sure that we are able to support the country to accompany their developments in whichever open source related aspects. To do so, we've formed a team, an international team of experts coming from various countries and having experience in developing digital public goods. And this has been uh, going on for about nine months. Uh, we've opened the roster for, um, um, for, for identifying complementary experts uh, which was quite successful with more than 200 applicants. We've shortlisted about 30, and then we've uh, created that, this nice team between ITU and, and UNDP. And they have been working on, for the last couple of months, the definition of that framework. So they've gone through various uh, type of uh, collaborative tools to define precisely the, the structure, the architecture of this uh, framework. So, as of today, uh, we have a documentation that will uh, shortly be published that's been uh, also sent to the community, to major stakeholders for uh, revision, that has um, a, a number of categories and modules of training courses that will offer to the countries that are seeking for support from the UN to develop their digital public goods. So, one will find support and training courses in the technical area for everything regarding open source uh, coding practices, security, hosting, deployment, scalability of these developments. There will also be open source specific trainings on, I would say, more targeted uh, technologies. Um, there's going to be support as well in the definition, the very definition of the digital public goods development uh, management program. Um, in the setup of their open source program office, their community uh, management around the open source developments, but also support in um, improving procurement practices and helping with uh, legal compliance, selecting the proper uh, licensing schemes depending on their digital strategy and uh, developments. As we are um, two UN agencies um, contributing to this. We'll also support in the capacity building, in the resource mobilization for these developments, and overall in the digital governance and sovereignty uh, and inclusion uh, considerations in these uh, developments. So this framework will, will provide guidance over policy development, community engagement, technical support, training and education, legal compliance, governance, partnerships, communications, uh, and overall uh, project management with proper open source related metrics. So this framework uh, we will deliver uh, with a team of experts as part of the open source program office activities in the country. So we will deploy open source program offices to manage open source software strategy to set policies uh, for using, developing, or contributing to open source development to provide guidance uh, between the teams, the partners involved in the ecosystem uh, over these developments to help with transparency, innovation, community-driven uh, development, uh, to help with internal standards uh, in their open source practices, and overall to coordinate uh, their open source uh, developments. These program offices, uh, and this is what's very concrete about this project, will be deployed in the country. So they will be locally staffed with, with, with uh, local people. Uh, so we'll have a program manager together with a team of experts in the different areas of their uh, expected open source developments. These open source program offices um, will be operational for two years with full funding from uh, our project. And of course, uh, we in the country selection process have been seeking for sustainability in the discussions with the concerned uh, countries. So to get to that stage, uh, we've uh, opened a, a call, uh, an open call for expressions of interest for the countries to apply um, with a a set of criteria, uh, so to make sure that there is a strong political commitment from the country to engage with that program and to provide sustainability. 
um, but also uh, to make sure that the country is sufficiently advanced, uh, mature enough in the open source arena to uh, host this open source program office and to um, be able and to maximize the impact of our uh, project. So countries having applied had to have already a nascent initial active open source ecosystem. They had to have identified strategic priority for their open source uh, developments and be considered a champion in their region of the world. Uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, made sure uh, that we ensure uh, diversity and representation of the different uh, regions uh, of the world. We also had a certain number of sub-criteria for the host itself because the open source program office has to be deployed within a legal entity that provides us with space, with offices, with internet connection and all the facilities to uh, support the open source development activities. So we've included a set of criteria to, so to make sure that we have hosts that are either public, academic or not-for-profit organizations with a clear mandate from the government to uh, proceed with these um, digital public goods and services developments. And of course, as part of the sustainability considerations, we've asked uh, the uh, applicants to come up with hosts that are already uh, sustainable income-wise, so the project is not their uh, sole source of funding. As a result uh, to this uh, open call, uh, we've received 23 applications from 20 countries in the world. Um, so you have in different colors the various regions of the world according to the ITU definition. And in yellow, you have the countries having applied thus far. So it could uh, seem a little uh, restrictive or small. Um, given the size of our project and number of applicants. But overall, these 20 countries, they represent 2.2 billion people. Um, and that's actually uh, almost a third of the uh, uh, population worldwide. So it's not that small. And all of the applications we've received, we were quite surprisingly amazed by the actual advancement they are uh, and they are making into open source related developments. So, as far as the selection uh, process is concerned, um, the outcome will be officialized by the end of September this year. Um, the discussions are well advanced and I can, however, in the meantime, uh, announce, make some announcements around the project. Just two, three things uh, re related to, um, three examples related to these uh, various applications that I wanted to pick just to give you an idea. Um, I, I selected randomly from the, the 24 applications free of interest. One is about Egypt. Egypt, uh, to give you an example, uh, started its digital transformation strategy since 2014. Um, they have developed the first version of their digital Egypt platform, which is the, the main forge for all of their, their um, upcoming digital public services. And it's already witnessing uh, the um, availability of 170 government services online. And this concerns 16 sectorial uh, platforms, including health, education, and so on. And that serves 9.5 million users. Kazakhstan is another interesting example. They are very much advanced in open source. Everything is open source at the government. It's already a 15-year journey into these developments. They have plus 30 uh, digital public services already available for 14 million users. And last but not least, uh, I wanted to use this example because this is also in the news, uh, Bangladesh. Um, it's into the strategy since 20 years, uh, more than 20 years. Uh, they have a, a, a vibrant and growing ecosystem uh, in open source, they support a number of countries with their digital public goods. They actually have published four in the di digital public goods uh, registry already. And they have more than 3,000 uh, public services digitalized that serve uh, 15 million users. And what's interesting about um, the news uh, in Bangladesh is that right at the moment, following the students' riots, 
the former uh, government had to resign, so they have an interim government, and one of their compelling uh, needs now is to develop services that are transparent, that are accessible, that do uh, solve the issues that led uh, to uh, the riots. So, as you can imagine, when we receive that many applications, we have to go through a highly qualitative process. So, just to give you a few numbers and uh, an, an understanding of uh, how we, we got there. So we did a first pre-analysis of the regions of the world and the potential countries and their advancements uh, using various indicators. Um, the United Nations have a number of indicators and each agency has its own um, that are related to their mandates. So we've been using four major UN indicators from uh, UNDP and ITU to come up with a state-of-the-art analysis of what the situation is worldwide, following which uh, we've opened the call. The call's been sent as, a, uh, as an official UN circular, so we could reach out to 193, and uh, we are now 194, uh, ITU member states, but we uh, reached out to 193 before uh, the uh, actual addition. Um, and um, 186 permanent missions, six ITU regional offices, 170 UNDP digital uh, focal points, and we could reach out to almost 5,000 people worldwide. So this resulted in the uh, 24, uh, 23 applications that we received from 20 countries. I'm saying 24 because we actually received one uh, very much later after the uh, uh, end of the call. Uh, so in principle, we have 24 from 21 countries, but uh, one was out of the actual deadlines. And we've uh, touched with uh, the, all of the regions of the world. So in that first, uh, expression of interest, we had about 22 questions uh, to address that would give us a number of indicators, um, which was then followed by a technical assessment. So we've asked all of the applicants to uh, respond an additional 11 questions to go deeper into the open source uh, technical related uh, issues. And then uh, we went through a short list and um, had semi-structured interviews with countries uh, from the shortlist to uh, really uh, consolidate our analysis. And with this, uh, end of June, we've come up with a potential list of two pilots, their backups in case, and with the intention of leaving no one behind. So we are gonna not only deploy the open source program offices in the two selected countries, but we'll also open an affiliate program for the other countries to join and to access for free the whole uh, training framework, plus some support from ITU and UNDP. The only counterpart will be that they will have to fund their own open source program office. And you can find more information uh, flashing this QR code. Uh, you will see QR codes everywhere in the presentation, so feel free afterwards to uh, consult these various uh, pages. <coughs> now, on the analysis itself, we um, could, from the various forms and, and uh, interviews, build a number of criteria and have them uh, consolidate an overview using a BCG matrix uh, to identify which are the stars and the sweet spot countries that we could uh, really impact on uh, by offering our support. So we have about a good dozen countries that are really well placed that if they receive this uh, little push will become stars uh, as the major three countries we discovered uh, throughout the applications. Secondly, uh, as I said, we will leave no one behind. So additionally to the OSPOs we will fund and deploy, we will create a network of affiliates. So all the other countries, they will have access to the training program for free and they will be part of that uh, network. This network we will develop in two phases. The first will mainly concern those that are in the sweet spot. And then the second phase will be to help, to really help those that are not yet that 
advanced uh, in terms of open source uh, maturity. Now, what is the intent with this? Uh, we want to deploy a UN-backed uh, network of open source program offices, which is a mixture of governmental and intergovernmental open source program offices. So we'll have two uh, fresh new from this uh, project in two countries. We'll have a number from the affiliate uh, countries as well. And we'll uh, team up with OSPOs already existing at various UN uh, agencies. The intent behind this is to uh, create a network into which we can team up, we can share, we can um, gear toward an international uh, governance and, um, and, and we can uh, further promote the actual training framework to help others. And actually, in doing so, we may come up with a more, I would say, standardized definition of what an open source program office is. And I did put a few uh, illustrations. Uh, I'm thankful to George Link from Baitertia. But we believe that these open source program offices, they should materialize. They should be more tangible. So we got to have them published in some sort of a registry where one can find more information about the existence of these open source program offices, their ongoing activities, what digital public goods they are supporting, and therefore the connection with the sustainable development goals. So we certainly will equip these open source program offices with a set of tools and key performance indicators just to make sure that their activity is well promoted and uh, that one can uh, actually find out. So in terms of the project uh, work plan, uh, we are on this uh, red line. So we've gone through the foundational works, uh, produced the framework documentation. We are now working on the training materials and courses that we will deliver as part of the open source program offices. The country selection process will be officialized by the end of this month, and then it will be followed by a deployment phases. ITU and UNDP will go concretely to the field, to the two countries, to deploy the open source program office, to staff the offices, and to get started with the training program. So over the two next years, uh, we will concretely get into these developments and make sure that we make an impact. In doing so, we are about to uh, form an advisory group um, that will be uh, meant to not only uh, get some um, advices and, and review and guidance over our uh, training uh, activities, but also to concretely contribute to the capacity building in, uh, into, in terms of training materials, coaches, and uh, partnerships. So this uh, advisory group will be publicly open. We will uh, seek for participation from the international community and from major stakeholders in the field to uh, make sure that we have an actual holistic portfolio of training courses. Additionally to this, uh, we'll also open a new roster of experts uh, because we are going to enter this phase of deployment on the ground. So there's going to be um, about 30 uh, experts that we will hire uh, that will be um, a mixture uh, between international experts and local experts to the countries selected. Now, um, as I said at the beginning, my colleague, Oba uh, Adiboy, could not make it today uh, from UNDP. He wanted to, uh, although, contribute to this uh, session, so he recorded a video message uh, that uh, clearly makes uh, the case on open source and how it breaks silos and, and helps unlocking brains uh, to uh, concur and uh, support in compelling uh, societal developments. So I will just display this message from over. Hi, everyone. My name is Obaluloa Ajiboye, and I'm a DPI open source analyst at the Chief Digital Office of UNDP. Our open source ecosystem enabler project, OSE, is focused on enhancing the capacity of local, regional, public, and private actors to adopt open source solutions for digital government services. In February 2022, 
we saw a shining example of the power of open source through the journey of Claire Charles, a remarkable 13-year-old Nigerian. Claire is not just passionate about tech, she actively contributes to the open source community. Her story began with a gl simple glance at the Twitter post, sparking her curiosity and setting her on a journey of discovery and contribution to this dynamic ecosystem. With mentorship and the right resources, Claire began making meaningful contributions to open source projects on GitHub. Notably, she has contributed to projects like Flame, a game engine built on top of Flutter that runs on mobile, desktop and web. Another is EdiHub, an open source community aimed at encouraging and promoting communication. Beyond technical contribution, she has become an advocate for inclusivity and accessibility in tech spaces, showing the true potential of open source as a collaborative and inclusive environment. Claire's journey perfectly encapsulates the transformative outcome our project strives to achieve. Through our story, we see how open source communities, when supported and nurtured, can empower young talent and drive innovation. Our project similarly aims and improve knowledge, coordinate actions, and strengthen the capacities of local, public, and private actors to adopt and create open source solutions for digital public service. Just as Claire has grown from a curious new newcomer to an active contributor, we aim to help public and private organizations transition from consumers of technology to contributors and creators in the digital public space. Through initiatives like Claire's involvement, we are building an ecosystem where knowledge is shared, innovation is fostered, and everyone, regardless of the age or background, has the opportunity to contribute to meaningful projects and digital advancement. Claire's contribution to projects like Flame and HeadyUp have not only enhanced the open source projects she worked on, but also inspired other young developers, peers, and mentors to embrace mentorship and collaboration. Our journey reflects the very mission of our project, OC, to create an environment where young individuals like Claire have the resources, mentorship, encouragement that they need to thrive and make impactful contributions. In conclusion, Claire Charles stands as a testament to the limitless potential of youth in technology and open source. Our journey showcases the transformative impact of inclusive tech communities Communities we are committed to fostering through our open source ecosystem enabler project. By strengthening local capacities and providing mentorship platform, we aim to ensure that more young talents like Claire have the opportunity to shape the future of digital public service through open source. Thank you very much. So that was a message from OBA and UNDP being our partner uh, in this project. Um, now, uh, what's coming up next? Um, so as I said, we are in the selection and preparation of the pilot countries uh, with our implementation planning. So this will be officialized by the end of the month and then we'll engage with the actual deployment. Uh, and then over uh, the beginning of next year, we'll uh, gear toward the um, actual uh, implementation of the framework itself and commence activities for full support to the concerned uh, countries. Um, there is uh, a host of um, uh, resources uh, that you can find from the slides if you want to hear more about what's been going on for this year and, and, and the various uh, discussions we could host. There are uh, interesting webinars we could carry out uh, thanks to AI for Good. Um, we actually have created a dedicated uh, track to um, digital public services and digital public goods. So um, you will certainly see announcements for upcoming webinars uh, in this particular track. Um, we had also uh, webinars on uh, data governance, uh, open data and related needs for uh, digital public services. And more recently, we um, started with the UN Innovation Network, a series of Tech Learn Talk on open source, uh, just to uh, further promote the use uh, and the mindset. Um, well, with this, I would like to thank you. If there are any questions on this presentation, feel free. Um, now it's 
for, uh, free forward Lee. So I still have a, a few slides more if you are interested on uh, ongoing other activities at ITU in open source. Um, actually, if you don't mind, I can go through these um, because I wanted to share as they are also interesting developments. First of all, uh, we have uh, developed uh, our own uh, open source program office at ITU uh, under the Development Bureau that's now supporting a number of projects, including the OZ that I just presented, but also GovStack and, and other initiatives, and one in particular. Uh, because following a series of webinars with the AI for Good, we've um, engaged uh, the community into discussing the actual uh, compelling needs uh, for digital public services to embrace open source artificial intelligence. And so um, we decided a couple of months ago to um, run a hackathon to create a community around these developments. And so we did, um, and we were quite uh, well uh, surprised because we had more than 180 participants, uh, of which more than, uh, well, about 85% were coming from Africa that contributed to this uh, nice uh, Akaton. And the, the objective there was to use large language models combined with retrieval augmented generation, which is kind of a trick to um, obtain uh, inexpensive uh, artificial intelligences that you can train over a restricted uh, data set. That is particularly useful because you are digitally sovereign. You can train this AI for your own needs uh, and therefore specialize it and, uh, and that has no cost actually. Uh, so you just need to um, get specialized on these technologies. So. We've run this hackathon and asked the community to come up with a more, um, a, a more um, um, improved version of these LLMs uh, combined with RAGS. And we've actually received 19 contributions from uh, 36 different countries. Uh, so they teamed up in subgroups uh, and competed. And the result of this is that we, we decided because this actually works, uh, and this is really becoming interesting for a number of countries, and in particular, uh, low and middle income countries that do not have uh, sufficient resources to uh, play with uh, more general or large uh, language models. And so we decided to create a working group and engage with a, a, an open source uh, development with the community. And so we are presently into, uh, into this uh, development. Uh, we have defined a simple use case, which is to build this um, automated chatbot for uh, public services discovery that you can train over your own data and uh, that you can take off the shelf from our repository. So the working group has been launched about a month ago. We now have more than 40 contributors and uh, more than 10 uh, major organizations, including a number of UN agencies that are contributing to this uh, compelling development. And this working group uh, now uh, is uh, focusing on a particular use case uh, with JIC um, in Kenya. So we are um, studying, uh, analyzing their needs in uh, public services discovery and how this open source AI could be tuned and uh, applied to their case. Uh, so to uh, come up to an off the shelf reference implementation that could be further used by other countries. And this may also be of interest to a number of countries that are part of our open source uh, project. One another initiative I wanted to mention is the CHAOS uh, Working Group uh, that's been uh, meeting uh, this week uh, at the conference that is presently um, thinking, further thinking about uh, how to produce key performance indicators in open source developments to uh, measure how much projects are contributing to sustainable development goals. So you have the pointer and you can uh, get more information there. This working group is fully open, so anyone can join. And last but not least, um, this was mentioned by uh, my colleague Omar Mossin during his keynote yesterday. 
the whole UN system is presently organizing and, and harmonizing its open source practices throughout the 55 agencies. And so we've created a community of practice, which is called the Open Source United, that has five major objectives and assets that it's working on right now. We are preparing uh, a software catalog to uh, document all open source developments that are taking place uh, within the UN, a common policy framework uh, that uh, will um, set uh, the rules and, uh, and, and help all of the agencies to uh, come up with a set of common practices, an open source license and guidance over uh, legal compliance, a code hosting platform for all these developments to have a common umbrella, and a cross-organizational capacity building program. And this is a really interesting development because that's the first time it happens and it's really transformational for the UN, I believe. And with this, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free. I hear you well. Okay. Um, so I saw your plan for implementation of the plan, like 23 countries apply for it. But actually, it's very low presence in the West Coast of America. I, I know you probably focus on low income countries, but in my opinion, for you know, in America, even in the West Coast, there are a lot of giant tech companies, but there are a lot of mid sized companies that are listed in the top. Yeah. Sure, thank you for, for this feedback. Um, unfortunately, the call was open and uh, it, it's been widely promoted uh, using a regular UN circular and all, uh, all the promotional channels we, uh, we know of and, and can use. Um, so it's, it's a pity we did not witness any um, applications from this uh, region of the, this side of the world. However, as I said, we will have this notion of a network that will extend over time. Uh, so phase one and two are mostly right at the moment uh, populated with those having applied. Uh, but uh, for the phase two, uh, we will have a, a second call. Um, they will not get any funding uh, per se. They will get in kind, but at least they can join the initiative and access for free the training program. So. It will still be open and um, we will make sure that this goes through a regular UN circular to all of the member states. So, and also wide spreading the word in these types of uh, conferences will help. Yes. No, the, the program will run until early 2027. So we've got two full years of support once the open source program offices are deployed in country. Um, and then uh, what we are trying to work on and, and to, to ensure with the selected countries is that there's going to be sustainability post project funding. So the agencies we're dealing with and most of the time it's actual digital uh, ministry in the country and uh, associated agencies. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, there is funding for the Open Source Program Office to uh, persist, to pertain after the, uh, the end of the project. Will that be applied to the other countries? If there's a, this kind of a pilot, you will have the results and what will be done with the results? So all of the resources that will have, except the, the actual staff and, and the developments that will be carried out, within the country for a given digital public goods or, or, or set of services. All of the training program, uh, we are gonna um, publish us, uh, using the ITU Academy, which is the main um, ITU training facility that all countries can access and that is always live. So 
the training program uh, will sustain. So it will be offered as a professional institutional program you can, uh, you can access from ITU Academy. So things will not disappear once the project is over. The, so with this project, we have a time frame that is shorter, and, I mean, in terms of funding. Uh, so we will conclude in February 2027. Uh, however, um, with our partners, we certainly will find a way to, uh, to, uh, to go further uh, into this direction with a, a, a second chapter. Um, but um, this will not stop the ITU and UNDP activities um, post-project anyways. Any questions? It's very interesting, and we should talk. Um, I, I work at CERN or TMD as well. But um, are you going to look into measuring the impact of open source on the countries where the OSPOs are being yes. deployed? And if so, do you already have an idea of um, methodologies or how to measure this? Well, <coughs> we haven't. Um, formalized the whole approach but what we are seeking to achieve is a concrete impact in the country for a target set of services to the actual citizens uh, so most likely the the um, this action uh, will result in a twofold uh, strategy there's going to be i think Part of the training uh, delivered to mass uh, workforces uh, with a more general endeavor, which is to support uh, the country and its services into open source developments. And there's going to be more, much more specific and targeted training that will be delivered uh, with the uh, intention to support a particular development in a digital public good or services. So we've started. Um, identifying those key services uh, that these countries uh, would be uh, seeking support to develop. We don't. The the thing is that it's not a. This pro, we have loads of projects uh, taking place uh, in the UN and through the various agencies. There are projects that are more generalistic that that do deliver training. At, extremely large uh, scale and spectrum. Here we are really trying to make a concrete and targeted impact. So also on, on like putting in place digital services based on open source? Yes, yes. Any further questions? Thank you very much.